back is the delay. Yeah, is this is terrible. To this what. is terrible. We're this sorry, everyone. Okay, We're not going to do this. <laughs> <laughs> this is amazing. And live video. Okay, it's done. Discard video. Or should I save it? No, okay. save it. So you can see us dancing, you know, <laughs> trying to get in the shot. <sighs> okay. Hey, how's it going? Yeah, I've been at my parents' house all week, and I'm in a really weird mood. The the joy so of the joy of like visiting a parent is that you get to see the parents, right? Like that's like that's the ideal here uh, for me anyway. I have sure. a, I have a pretty good relationship with my parents, and uh, so being in their house is like this exciting thing where we're supposed to be like, yay, building memories, bonding as adults that are just hanging out. They're not here. We're just watching their dog, and so like oh, that I'm, would be here in not my childhood home this is just like the fourth home that my parents have lived in since my childhood home i have no emotional attachment to anything here i mean like so you're just house sitting in a random house yeah i'm guessing you're a, a little bit bored it's like it's like if i booked the worst airbnb <laughs> yeah. just, just like i, I need a week before. in the country and then you know here i am in a massive house a lo- you know without well, my parents i'm glad to i'm glad to interrupt your uh boredom with doing a podcast that's a nice reason to get up and do something with your day but i do apologize uh i missed our normal recording time yesterday hilariously ambitious of me to think that i would be totally fine to uh, record friday morning after three flights home to yeah get back three, from Hawaii. three red eyes in a row and you were like, no, I can do that. Yeah, no, I, uh, and then I took a weird nap time yesterday. So my body is just completely wrecked right now. I described it like this. Let's see. To somebody yesterday that I was talking to, my body thinks it's 6 p.m. already, but it should think it's 5.30 a.m. And it's actually 11.30 a.m. Which is wild because you're about <laughs> to fly another nine hours into the future, right? Seven hours into the future? I don't remember where Prague is. It's going to be. In time zone world. I don't remember. I think there are maybe seven hours ahead. I know where Prague is. I mean, I know where the... No, 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 the actual hours. Yeah, yeah, I just don't know the time zones. I was the geography bee champion of my school, and then I got invited to the geography bee of Idaho, to compete against all the other nerds and i got there yeah and that's... a fourth grader was sitting next to me i was in eighth grade and he was like hey man did you study tell me your study regimen and i was like study and he's like i've been studying for this since i was five and i was like that makes sense on why you're here oh, in the fourth okay. grade and i was like i looked at a that's... national geographic on the drive up here oops anyway hmm. i got like fifth seventh eighth something i made it i made i made it further than i should have should have uh, studied should have studied yeah i want to know what that kid's doing with his life now that's uh that is the nerdiest thing i think i've ever heard anyone say that's even more nerdy than a spelling bee geography i i uh i i lost the spelling bee on the word mayonnaise oh uh, i lost on neighbor neighbor I eight years old oh i was yeah. a little older but you know <sighs> Anyway, enough about. I'm just feeling very <laughs> nostalgic. Yeah, you came home to a very beautiful, a very beautiful Canon 135 lens. What's your aperture, Sam? It's an f 1.8. So for Canon shooters that like 135, I can already tell you, though I haven't actually looked at the files or even shot a wedding with it, buy this lens. <laughs> It's, uh, I don't remember the cost on it because I pre-ordered it way back in November. They're only now finally starting to ship, but it's actually lighter than the 135 EF mount. And that is a 135 F 2.0. So you're getting 1.8, a couple extra function buttons. It's freaking lightweight. It's smaller, like footprint than the previous one. Actually, no, the previous one is a little bit bigger footprint, but it's lighter and, uh, it balances just so well with the r3 very impressed so that's my quick little hot take on the new 135 if that's your go do you want to guess how much it was then uh, i'm gonna guess 2100 bucks Woo! nailed it look at this guy 
exactly twenty one hundred dollars. I forgot. Impressed. I mean, because mirrorless systems have been so good and fast with autofocus that it's kind of becoming a wash at this point. But I actually forgot uh, that the lens itself can make a huge difference in autofocus, like speed and accuracy, because they're all, like I said, just so fast. But this 135 is notably, I don't know how to describe it. I would I, like when you pick a focus point and it latches onto that as the subject, it's just very sticky to that. Like you can move the camera very, very, very rapidly and it just follows it like it's stuck. And uh, the 50 1.2 RF doesn't quite do that. It's still very good, but it's notably better. So they're clearly doing um, a great job with their, their newer releases of lenses. I wish they could reissue the 51.2 with whatever they did to make this autofocus the way that it does. Okay, enough, enough about this. But do you shoot 135? What, what's the longest? I, I, shoot, no, I, sh- I, I, I shoot whatever you lend me, Sam. That's my new rule. Okay. I, I'm just, nice. I'm using Sam's discards. No, I, <laughs> discards. No, I don't. Right. I, don't I was going to sh- throw these on the street anyway, if anything. Yeah, I was just tossing them, uh, tossing <laughs> them out. You're doing me a favor. Uh, I don't know why you're British in this version. Uh, it wasn't very British either. <laughs> I've, I've, Is that I've your been, impression of me with a British accent? That was awful. I've been coronation pilled accidentally by just opening the internet and seeing an old man become a king. That felt weird. It's 2023. Why are we still doing kings? <sighs> Sorry. Is that why I've seen stuff in the news? I really don't. Yeah, monarchy, news, so monarchy I'm stuff sure in the in about. the British. Oh. King Charles is getting coronated yeah, I today. Could, could I apologize to any British listeners that are a fan of the monarchy. Man, wouldn't that be great if that was my first cancellation? I would... I would <laughs> local man minorly complains about the coronation. <laughs> Canceled. Mm, yeah. No, so I don't... Mm, uh, I don't, I don't shoot... Cancel you for that. I, don't, I don't shoot anything past 70. Because I don't own anything past 70. That's it. Okay. I used to. I used to have a 7200. And that was... That was my guy... And I, and I also had a little fella of the 85, but like yeah. nine times out of 10, I never took off the 24 to 70 and like would second body a 24 or a 35 at the reception if I yeah. needed something else. You know, I wonder, this is just m- my sense of how things trend, but it seems that a lot of photographers in their early days do prefer telephoto, I think. Like an 85, 135, 70, 200, like, like you mentioned. But I don't know if that's entirely true, but I, it feels like it is. And I wonder if that's because they, I, I think a lot uh, about what your choice in focal length does to where you physically have to be in space as you're walking around with your feet. And I think that the telephoto lenses are preferred early on because maybe photographers aren't as comfortable getting close to people. And so that affords you the ability to just be way off in the distance and observing without, you know, having this awkward social interaction. It shocks me when I have like a new photographer covering an event or something at the press club, how often like the candid photos of people just mingling in the room uh, show a lot of the backs of people because the photographer clearly isn't comfortable, like getting and poking their lens like right up in between beside you know whoever's back is facing you and it's and it creates a sense of awkwardness and distance and you physically can't see more than maybe the one person who's actually facing you and then the backs of everyone else Um, but that tends to be with wider focal lengths and yeah i think it just comes down to somebody not being comfortable with that like physical social interaction and a telephoto really does afford you that um escape if that makes sense I'm just kind of ranting at this point but i do wonder uh if it's less about the look and compression of a telephoto and the bokeh and more about like a comfort level with with where they're standing so for when you're <laughs> sorry i just i just have this idea about you with like a like a fish eye or 24 millimeter just running up everywhere like hey guys what's up <laughs> Uh, th- this idea. I of- mean, I have a great photo with my. Have you seen my probe lens? That was one that was in the white case downtown. It's no. the scary, like, looks like a gun almost. It's really, really, really long. Oh, I thought that was a um, shotgun mic. <laughs> no, it's a lens. Uh, it's a 14 millimeter macro lens. It's super wide and ultra macro. 
but I took it out to a wedding once and tried photographing candidates during a cocktail hour. But uh, people were very drunk at this wedding, and one guy, he let me take a picture inside his mouth. Was, wow. Yeah, so you're not Love that, that far you. off with the, with the idea of <laughs> what I'm willing to do. Yeah. So when... It took a long time to get to that comfort level, though. I'm not going to lie. Right. Oh, like, there were a couple of years uh, when I was shooting weddings that it was just as people started to pay videographers, right? You know, like, I was looking through old family albums... Uh, while I was here at my parents' house and I found my parents' wedding photo album and, like, it's just someone with a point-and-shoot in the 80s, right? Like, whatever you'd have in, like, 1982. uh, Shout-out to August 8th, 1982 for being my parents' wedding day. Very adorable. My dad wanted to wait Wait, until... Wait, didn't hire a photographer at all? It was just a... No. If they did, they were terrible. (laughs) But, like... Okay. I mean, mean, it was the 80s. Right, like the yeah, but they had photographers then. Right, but there's been like there's been a come up in the last like twenty years of how much someone should expect to spend on a wedding photographer. True. Right, like it stopped being a true. Let's get candids and like let's get artistic. And right around when I was shooting weddings is right when the um, upswing in like affordable good quality digital video cameras were coming out so videographers were starting to show up more at weddings like the first wedding season i had there were like i shot like 15 or 20 weddings and there were only like one or two videographers and then you know the next season there were a few more and by the time that i left the industry there were like there was a videographer at every every wedding do you say Uh, videographer you you, you really pronounce that properly how do you pronounce it i would say videographer uh, You're skipping a I, letter. I that <laughs> Videographer. That's so funny. Have we talked about that, how I missed my critical speech funny? period? Yes, we did. Yeah, because yeah, yeah. of I don't aluminum. Know it, I don't... It was on a... mm-hmm. Did I just say aluminum correctly? Videographer. <laughs> you did. <laughs> oh, my God. Okay. I don't know if this is a released episode, for, so in case uh, it's not, I missed my critical speech period from birth to three. I had ear infections, so I didn't hear uh, any words from as a kid. And so I had, uh, my own made up language that my brother spoke and that was it. And then I had to go to speech therapy when I was four. It took three years of speech therapy for me to just learn that like this mug is a mug and not a dupa, right? That level of thing. And there are a few words that I really can't say such as aluminum. <laughs> you're crushing it you're good no i got that, that one wrong good. aluminium <clears throat> so i say it like a british person i say aluminium uh yeah anyway that was very exciting for me got distracted videographer so i say yeah i say the whole thing because there's a middle because yeah. <laughs> you're right in the pronunciation it's fine i i completely derailed your lovely story about your parents uh you well, know, no, so <laughs> their, their wedding photos aren't great, right? You know, and there's no video of it at all. Uh, my wedding photos were, like, pretty good, and there's video of it, right? Like, this has, it has got increased, the documentation of a wedding has gotten increasingly more as time has gone on. Uh, and so, like, when you are at a wedding, do you meet with a videographer? Do you do you like stake out claims? Do you ever get in fisticuffs with a videographer? Like, how's this? <laughs> you know, because you were like talking about, yeah. uh, you know, telephoto lenses and getting closer. But one of the reasons that I shot with the telephoto is because I wanted to be far away from everyone, because I didn't, I didn't, I didn't want to step in front of someone while they were like shooting the kiss or like shooting a romantic moment accidentally yeah. step in front of the, someone with a camera or a videographer right like i don't care if i step in front of uncle tim's shot right yeah. but i do care if the and so i stayed far away with a telephoto which is why i use telephoto but now i'm Makes also sense. thinking that it's probably could be because i was a little bit nervous because of course i was a little bit nervous i was like 20 something yep we're both right here but i'm curious on what you do how do you navigate these Situations. It's a good question and uh, timely because I just hit delivery yesterday afternoon of a wedding where I had a particularly great interaction with a videographer. Now I want to say videographer. Um, it was welcome okay, so to a, pronouncing <laughs> videographer correctly. The letters. There's <laughs> yeah. so many factors that <laughs> it's it's almost difficult to know where to start with with this discussion but up front i'll say no i never reach out it is a question i ask my couples if they're going to have one 
and they usually do like share who it is in their contact info, but I never reach out. Sometimes uh, they will proactively call me. That's totally fine. We'll have a talk about whatever, but uh, you know, it's, those talks are completely pointless <laughs> because <laughs> You know, as much as they plan and try and get to know me and blah, 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 you don't really know how somebody is and how they interact in time and space until they're right there with you with their cameras operating. Because there's plenty of videographers I, I've worked with that they're, they're lovely people, like as humans. And as soon as they start recording, it's like, what are you doing? <laughs> you are all up in the way. You have no sense of where you are and when to like, lean into things, lean out to things, when to let me. So it's kind of this weird dance that you end up playing with a lot of videographers. And some people just have a good sense, um, sensibility and, and some people don't. And some people are very selfish with the shot, like, and, and some people aren't, it's, it's a really tough thing, but I find that it's pretty fruitless to, to call and prepare. I think that's a nerve settling strategy, not very helpful with the actual work that you're both doing. And it's interesting, this videographer that I had a particularly great interaction with was, you know, probably 15 years older than me, just a very different vibe overall, but like personality wise, but work wise, we were firing all cylinders. We clicked perfectly. He understood what I was going for. I understood what they were going for. And a lot of videographers, honestly, should be able to shoot over kind of your your shoulder as a photographer quite often. Now, I mean, I've, like sometimes they have really particular shots that they like to get like 360 shots or some like pose and moment that they, you know, always go for and have sort of set that expectation with their clients. So yeah, lean in, take control. Uh, but you know, the best ones I find are where you can just kind of, I can drive the, the ship and then as needed, they can swoop in and drive the ship if they need. That's how I refer to the ship posing my yep. couples i guess <laughs> driving but driving yeah, you're shipping your couples it's important it's an interesting thing and, and another comment i remember uh, that same great videographer uh, that i worked with making was he was like well i asked him because i was like i never get to see other photographers work uh, i'm always the lead shooter maybe i bring a second that's the only time i ever see anybody else work and that's probably very different than how any you know a second photographer is going to photograph a wedding differently than when they're primary and he was like oh you sam are a breath of fresh air. And I was like, really? How so? He's like, well, just so many photographers are way too selfish and, and pushed in there. And he's like, I had a, a, a videographer last week that was, uh, you know, just so rude and shot, shot the whole thing on a 35. So she was always in the shot. And I found that an interesting comment because I shoot 24 and 50. So most people that shoot 35 paired up with an 85, which means they generally That's have a me. tendency to be... <laughs> a little further away from their subject. 35 and 85, like that gives you some distance. 24 and 50 does not. <laughs> uh, I'm right up in there. But I think I'm just so kind of in and out. Like I know when I have my moment and I'm willing to move on versus you know, hanging on for that extra shot that may or may not ever happen, whatever. I don't know. I just I try and maintain the sense of perspective. And also it goes a long way to uh, proactively mention or ask a question to a videographer like, Hey, uh, where are you going to be for the ceremony? Do you have any cameras? Um, you know, do you prefer whatever, whatever questions you want to ask? It almost doesn't even matter. Just engaging with them from a, a sense of, uh, I'm trying to be aware here of what you want and what you need that starts to pay you back. Hopefully if they're reasonable people and that they will probably be more considerate of what you need as the photographer. So it's this whole kind of dance, but everyone's so different. It's, it's really not um, something you can navigate until you're right there in the moment. So very long answer to your question, but yeah. I, I will that. say one, one final thing before you want to interject, but uh, over the years, it's become so nice to have a videographer there for, for two reasons. Uh, one, their lights are so much better than they used to be just because of really bright, affordable LED lights now versus the older ones where they were giant battery packs attached to lights. LEDs now are, you know, they're completely, they just float in the air with their batteries. There's no wires or anything most of the time. Uh, I just, I, I love using their lights as backlight during like dance floor pictures. Sometimes I share reception photos and photographers are like, I thought you didn't use off camera flash. And I don't, that's either the DJ or more likely a videographer having a light up on the corner and me balancing my ambient against my bounce flash to let that light come into the shot. And it just adds a nice 
random extra dimension to my reception photos. It's not always there, but it's, it's nice to see. The other thing, and I do this with a second photographer if I have one, uh, but giving a videographer like, hey, go take them for five minutes or whatever, like giving them that space to do that. I don't typically just stop and take a break for five minutes. That gives me some breathing room to like plan out the next shot. It, that's probably the most amount of quote scouting I ever do on a location is like giving the couple to somebody else so I can unplug, disconnect from the, the conversation of trying to keep things, you know, happy and moving and really concentrate on like something more creative and interesting to roll into next. Giving the videographer that freedom uh, is awesome. In fact, I hate when videographers are like, no, I'm good. Like, no, 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 you, you don't see what I'm doing here. Like, take them for five minutes, please. What, uh, this, is, this is a terrible idea. I'm prefacing this with a terrible idea, but how long are we gonna have to wait before Sam just starts Sam Hurd weddings this is I, I was gonna ask a question when are you gonna just like bring on a videographer full-time and just offer videographer services right like should you just like you know text that text that nice man and be like hey do you want to just be part of my package great right and then i was like well if you're doing that that it just like snowballed into sam you should just have a wedding you you know just just full click a button and pay you pay you 20 grand or you know 50 grand whatever i don't know weddings are expensive now and then it just happens you know you could turn uh, you could turn your a-frame into a venue instead of your house you could okay, just have sure. a little yeah yeah this would be great this great really venue. escalated you're now moving be awesome yeah <laughs> you don't live no here I, anymore. so i have had conversations with um, a couple different videographers about doing like a partnership so it is sort of a one contract, one payment for the couple to, to deal with. It's just, I don't, I don't actually want to encourage video cause I don't like it as a product. <laughs> just don't. <laughs> I love videographers. And I love working with them, but I'm just like, I just don't <laughs> like it. I don't watch YouTube. I mean, I love film and, and TV you don't shows watch stuff, YouTube. I just, I, Wait, I really, I almost never watch YouTube. This is why I'm so, I'm so what? I love this. I just this love. Why, I I love why discovering I'm so bad your... about getting my own YouTube stuff like up. <laughs> Cause I, hate I, I really, I really love finding the edges of your internet consumption, your media consumption. Yes to Reddit, no to YouTube. What a shocker! I'm the other way. I'm and yes Reddit to went YouTube. through a weird phase of like starting to pepper in video a lot more, kind of like TikToky stuff. And thank God, I don't know if I changed something or if they auto learn that I don't like video because I, I don't see them anymore. I turned off autoplay. I just don't. It's too, um, too distracting. I mean, everything else is distracting, but video is all consuming because it's audio generally and sight and moving. Like it's just too, it's way too consuming for my attention. So, but the big thing at the end of the day is, is it really for the couple that much better than me sending a list of two or three, you know, studios or specific videographers that I work with and like and have a good experience with. I think that's probably just as easy. And and then video is so specific style wise. I've never seen a videographer that shoots video like I shoot photos. There are some styles in photography where the video and the um the photo styles like are totally they enmesh themselves, but maybe it's something to do with my editing. I think more it's my specific kind of the geometry in a lot of my compositions it just doesn't come across in video. And so, yeah, I, I wouldn't want to um, tie a, Yeah, here's a list of three people. I trust them, book whoever you want. But I, again, I also don't like to like nudge people toward the I'm really hung up on how you just don't like, like video. Oh, we can't afford a video. <laughs> right, like you just, <laughs> you just don't like video at all. That's great. You can create a lot of video for someone that doesn't like video. <sighs> and I don't know if you can tell, but I'm not, it's not... Does, does my love of the process come through in video stuff? Because I feel like it comes through in my still photos, like that I genuinely love what I'm doing here. I don't think that comes through in my video because it's generally like, okay, I have to get this done. Now I can respect and understand video as a, a learning tool. Like some things are just way better explained in video than in an article or a podcast or something like that. But so yeah, it's useful. And sometimes you just have to suck it up and do it. But that is the mindset I generally have every time I open DaVinci Resolve. All right, 
suck it up and get it done. I <laughs> uh, hate it. Now, I will say, though, the only thing, uh, the only consistent part of a wedding day where I'm like, oh, I'm glad there's a videographer here is if uh, for toasts, like just the nice occasionally you get somebody who's giving a, a just the most amazing toast you've ever heard. Uh, I've heard some insanely beautiful, deep things, <laughs> and I've also heard plenty of bad things, but you never know when that's really going to happen. I've only given one toast. And I'm really Do you watch that. YouTube. Of course I watch YouTube. Mm. I didn't watch YouTube to write my toast, and that was my mistake. I should have done better. Well, jokes on me, wedding didn't Well, last, I can't tell so. you how many times I've heard that be part of a toast itself. It's like, well, I should have done more I work. No, YouTube, I did the give work. A toast. It was, it was the, you know, the trouble was, it was the, it was the audience. It, that was the problem. I couldn't talk to the couple oh, directly sure. it because it was fault. a... No, it was, it, because the, the, the... <sighs> The bride's family was still deeply religious. The groom's family was pretty religious. And the bride and groom and mm. myself and our entire friend group and wedding party were not and did not. But oh. they, all, to appease the grandmother and to get the wedding gift that they got, they uh, appeased and had a religious wedding. And so I was just like, yep. I sure love you, you guys, you, you too, you're great. You know, like I remember from childhood things and I couldn't like tell real stories about like how, you know, we're all, uh, it, it's hard to, you know, it's, it's hard to talk about how religious. wild, uh, love is. Turn off all alarms. Oh my God. What are you doing? It's my master bedroom alarm is, was, was ringing. Sorry. Continue. I'll edit that out. <laughs> I marked. I was, it I was worried I wasn't going to wake up at nine a.m. <laughs> or by nine a.m., but I was up like three hours ago. So no typical. Way. Okay, typical. Sorry, I interrupted your story. Continue. You did. So no video evidence of this toast. Was no, there, thank was, God. No. They did not have okay. a video article. Exactly. They, that's, <laughs> that's how. What I'm saying. That's how I got like lucky. We're on the same page. I mean, like I I don't know what it's for. Except. Well, that's what I'm saying. Like, okay, I know what it's for theoretically, but he, here's one of the things I love about photos, especially when it relates to a wedding, is your memories start to change and dissolve over time, right? That's everybody. I think what happens is the more you start to forget the, the real details of your wedding day, the more the photos you look at afterward become your memories. Like you start remembering the wedding day through the still photos and what you actually start to picture in your head becomes probably very, very different than how it actually was. And hopefully in a positive direction, if it's really good photos and you're still married years later and it's all good you know, memories. But like that is an amazingly powerful effect. And if you have that built up over time in your mind and then you sit down 20 years from now and watch a video, it's like, oh, that's actually what happened. You know, that, that could go either way, I suppose, like where it's like, oh, that's even better than I remembered, or I totally forgot that, like, there was a stain on my thing the whole time, because, you know, maybe the photographer edited it out, who knows? But I just, yeah, I, I like having a detachment from the exact 100% reality of what occurred. And uh, I mean, obviously, videography can have a, a highly edited series and like story of the day that that also gives you um like a fantastical sense of, of what occurred but i think a lot of videographers especially with toasts and whatnot it's just like a camera planted and then they cut kind of between things like the the longer cut of of wedding films is pretty this is this is just what's happening i don't know these, these are things i think about far too much <laughs> and i have no real justification are. for because i've never had a wedding videographer no, you can be romantic about what comes up in the fertile ground of memories disintegrating, right? Like there, there's a lot to, I don't know, we don't need to record and ever, you know, like there, there's a, there's a trend that has popped up on the internet over the last, whatever, 20 years, uh, as more and more information has become available and more and more, um, stuff has become available where people want to be completionist about things mm, right like they totally. i i did a photo project for a conference uh that was uh, i asked you know the same everyone that i took a portrait of the same question and then compiled their answers 
Uh, and so it was like 80 something portraits over a couple of days. And then, uh, you know, like thoughtful little conversations or little nuggets of information underneath it. I released it. It was, you know, probably the biggest, you know, like personal project I've ever done. You, you, tens of thousands of people viewed it in the first day or two. And wow. the number one request that I got, it was, uh, it was a directory and a random button. So you could click through every single person if you wanted to, or a random button, you would just get someone else. But I, I got so many requests in those like 36 hours that it was like Hurrah! all over the internet for the little conference to just add a next button. And I was like, why? And they're like, well, I want to finish it. I'm like, oh. <laughs> you're missing oh, the point, wow. right? Like, this isn't about like reading 82 tweets in a row and then never forgetting about it. It would be like, you, you don't know what's going to show up and the order that it shows up in is important, right? Like the surprise order that these things show up in matters. And there's, uh, there's just, you lose, you lose room for magic when you want a hundred percent everything in your own life yes. and optimize. I worry all the time about my own creative work around optimizing away the thing that makes it good right mm -hmm. you know like mm -hmm. i worry about this in my writing of like oh i'm am i editing out the thing that i should leave in like the imperfections or what make this paragraph or this story really work or you know like the photos like how much do i edit out because you can edit out anything now right like you, you totally that's a, something that's a common delete. issue that's a common yeah. issue with a lot of people that create things i feel like i i can't quite recall but i think i just shared on instagram stories one of my favorite quotes from the creative act uh where he goes into this like sometimes oh i definitely did because i it was a, attached to a picture of uh sunflowers that was this beautiful huge field of sunflowers in hawaii and um it was totally back focused on the mountains which i didn't intend for i meant to focus on the flowers but that ended up being like my favorite shot from that series. Uh, and you know, I saw it in the moment and I took it just because, but then I was like, Oh, it back focus. I'm going to you know, focus on the flowers. The imperfections you're tempted to fix might prove to be what make the work great. This actually reminds me of a milestone moment in my life is very small. I have a lot of weird, small things like this that, like stay with me and inform my approach big time. Uh, it was like some Nirvana documentary or maybe it was something specifically about Kurt Cobain like forever ago. And they were just showing random pages from his journal, like where he would write lyrics and song ideas and um, like scribble, I don't know, just concepts. And it was just a few like brief flashes of it. And one little line that he had scribbled was, learn how to not play guitar. <laughs> and I was like, why would any, why would he put that? That's so weird. And I think that that kind of dials into what you're talking about with, you reach a certain level of knowledgeability and familiarity with the process. Yeah, you kind of become in danger of stopping growth or you just lose that uh, ability to tap into, yeah, that thing that made the, your work great. And, so there's some value in keeping some gaps in terms of your knowledge set. I have weird giant gaps and things that I don't know. And people are sometimes shocked about that. I mean, I think not ever watching YouTube is probably one of those ways that I keep that in my life is just <laughs> not have, like I've never seen Tiger King, like people like bring up random stuff that supposedly everybody knows about. And I'm just like, I haven't a clue what you're talking about. You know, it's not like I'm purposely rejecting something. I'm sure I would love Tiger King or I would love plenty of YouTubers out there. I guarantee it. In fact, it's just, uh, I try and yeah, keep these knowledge gaps in my life. Um, oh, like this is a big part of uh, my audio experience. I don't know a lot of basics relating to like impedance and stuff like that. The way um, you can power match like amps on guitars to cabs and all this other stuff. Like I know fundamentally what's occurring, but I don't actually know uh, the practice of how you do a lot of these things um, properly. Because I, again, I like having certain knowledge gaps about things. Uh, I mean, man, yeah. that's how I feel about cameras <laughs> this well, whole that's time good <laughs> right like the i i was explaining it, it's one of those things that like once you learn it you know but then you 
like forget the specifics. Sure. Uh, you can you can explain uh, why aperture, you know, like what it is, and then like you can explain the difference between like oh no no actually wide open is different. That's the smaller number. I could understand why you think it'd be bigger, uh, right? But like that's kind of it. Yeah. Right. Like I don't I don't really remember anything else. Uh, and because I don't, you know, like <laughs> you okay. switched. You've been trying the Nikon Z9, right? Is that I get the number right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, Z9, as everybody. Z9. I was just with. I was surrounded by a bunch of Canadians in Hawaii, and they kept bringing up the the Z9 in my hand. <laughs> That's adorable. It's just funny. Okay, good. Uh, mm. So yeah, like you've been you've been shooting with that for the last you know whatever it's been like two weeks before that you you know were shooting with the comparable Canon R3 model, I could not switch between a camera body like that because I only know just enough yep. about the cameras and photography to use the system that I have, right? You know, like you lent me the Fujifilm uh, on a Thursday and then you came over to my house on a Friday and we're like, hey, use this yet? And I was like, no, nope. Nope. Oh, right. And like the, like I, some of the, the buttons to punch in and, and check focus and yeah, all that. Right, right, right. Right. So like I, I you know, I said no because mm. the uh, I was busy or whatever, but it wasn't because I was busy. It's because it was going to take me multiple hours of like wandering around a park to figure out how the camera worked because I don't have the baseline knowledge of shooting with professional mm. cameras at the moment. Right. So I know how my camera works and what yep. I need it to do to get it produce the photos I want. But that's it, right? Like, I don't know how the camera is actually doing it. Even then, right? Like, I can't, <laughs> I can't figure out how to make the Q2 shoot longer than a 20-second exposure. It's driving me nuts. I huh. know something's, a setting somewhere is wrong. I can't figure it out. So, like, I was shooting Star Trails and Milky Way stuff during a lightning storm in Mexico. I was having a beautiful time, but I wanted it to go longer. I was like, give me 30 yeah. seconds. Is there a so bulb I... mode? Maybe that it's called bulb. I don't know. Maybe that's what you need. That's what they called it in Nikon cameras, I think. I, I Yeah, because then you plug in the thing and then you have your little switch and you can just switch it boop, yep. forever, right? You know, like I also, mm-hmm. as, a, as a youth, right, like bought the remote shutter that had the little button that you'd click and, you know, shot like 10 minute bulbs of my mom's fridge and, you know, here's a campfire for an hour, yeah. that sort of thing. Uh, so, like, I know about them, right? I know how to do this in the abstract. But, like, then in the practice, I was like, oh, yeah, I know how to, oh, I don't know how to do this. And so just <laughs> pushed it, you know, like, did shutter priority and pushed it as far as it would go. Uh, and then, you know, here are nice 20-second photos. That was great. But then my knowledge gap stopped me from being able to, like, get the exact photo I wanted because the lightning was ah, okay. sporadic, right? So it needed that 30-second exposure. So I have a lot of... Uh, a lot of images that needed uh, another 10 seconds or whatever to get the full lightning effect. So I didn't get massive lightning strikes or anything. I just got like a single guy. Huge bummer. That's my bad. Yeah. And so like I couldn't well, use I mean, your... I don't think it's an un- uncommon um, situation to be in. Even like successful professional photographers that I know do have their camera set up a very specific way. And if they were handed my camera which is set up the way that i like like they wouldn't be able to even begin to remember how exactly they have their like it, like that's fine I, I it's a common thing it's it's tough to um what am i trying to get across here i i know every single layer of every aspect of my camera so i think that's one reason i, I tend to like switching things up and experimenting with other brands a lot because uh it does kind of give me like a new camera is by default like gonna have a little bit of new gaps in my knowledge of how it works because i'm just not as familiar with the nikon z9 as i am with the r3 but yeah i don't know it's tough tough to really talk about you're kind of yeah like you're pretty you're pretty platform agnostic ish right because you've stuck with you've stuck with canon for like the last few years this lens is freaking amazing. Yes, stop, I, I have stop been Canon taking and- photos of your desk <laughs> and focus on the podcast. <laughs> the, I will say ergonomically, uh, I was always jealous of, of Canon cameras. 
Um, although this may be an interesting way to take the discussion. I was always in my Nikon DSLR years when I taught the most in-person workshops. I don't think we've talked about this before. I, I was always very surprised with how often Canon shooters would shoot stop down to like f2.0, even though they have like 1.2 lenses that are perfectly sharp. And, and I just never understood why. And I then realized, oh, the Canon autofocus in their DSLRs is just way less accurate and reliable compared to Nikon. Nikon allowed me the ability to shoot at 1.4 and not really have to worry nearly as much. So that like totally informed the look of my photos and, and the mindset that I was operating from compared to Canon photographers who had to shoot a little stop down just because they were freaked out about getting that one shot, you know, perfectly sharp or not. Where was I going with that? I don't know, but I'm ready. That sounded great. But no, it, it's coming back. It's, it's important. It's important to think about and experiment with um, all platforms because I, I'm terrified of having such a knowledge gap that, like, I love the look of my photos wide open. It's a huge part of uh, how I developed my preset and how I edit everything. If I shot at, you know, with my 1.4 50, my go-to Nikon lens was a 58 1.4. Love that thing. If I shot it at f2 or 2.8 all the time because I was the autofocus just couldn't keep up, then my editing would actually look totally different than it is now. And I'm glad that's not the case because I love the way my editing looks. Like it took a long time to get to that feeling, trust me, but, and it's very like, it sets you apart. So like experimenting and be, being willing to jump to Sony or jump to Fuji or whatever and become familiar is, yeah, just this kind of reassuring in terms of knowing the, the way that I wanna shoot is this is the right tool for the job. For me though, that's the other whole issue with all of this is like, that ties into how comfortable I am in physical space around people compared to somebody else uh, versus how I like to edit versus somebody else. Like it's just, it's just a mess of ideas out there. It's really We're all just making decisions. We're all just <laughs> all making just make choices. Decisions. I think my brain's in a little bit of overload right now because uh, you know I just got back from this wonderful conference uh, by a company hosted by a company called Focal. They do websites for photographers. It's called Not a Conference, and the entire idea is just most of the time spent with uh, these 60, 70 people that were there for three days um, in Hawaii. Most of the time is spent out shooting. As a teacher, there's four instructors, and we each got smaller groups from the 60, 70 folks. So it was probably 15, 20 people each group. And then you shoot for two hours, take a break, shoot for two hours. And then there's generally a, like a free for all shooting afterward because it's Hawaii and everybody's taking photos all the time. But the, uh, the number of discussions and insights about photography is uh, very overwhelming. <laughs> I should say, it really gets my mind spinning, and I love it. It's a really interesting um, experience to do that, but it's uh, a little overwhelming. Should uh, we give everyone who goes to these conferences a free Glass account in exchange for them flying me to Hawaii with you next time? <laughs> we could record on the beach, Sam. Yeah. I've never That's been to really Hawaii. Good. It's my 50th state. I've been to all 49 other states. Oh, my states. gosh. Oh, I wish you could have come with. It's well, uh, lovely. It's, it's far. That's my problem. Every time it's I'm like, oh, far. let's go, right? You know, like, I, I hit all of the states by the time I was, like, 23 besides Hawaii. I could never afford wow. it. And then by the time I could afford it, I was like, I can afford to get to Hawaii now. But then you're in Hawaii, and I couldn't afford to be in Hawaii. And so yes, then I was like, I'm going to figure this out. And then, like, next level, okay, if, Great, I can finally afford it. But then I was like, okay, well, I'm on the East Coast. I can fly to Hawaii or I can fly to closer tropical islands Europe. or Europe or, you oh, know, or, like yeah, it's a yeah. Aruba or the Bahamas. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. Honestly, Hawaii is amazing, but the, uh, the actual weather and general, like, if you just go in to relax, it, it's totally fine to just go to the Caribbean. I don't think it's going to be that game-changing but hawaii if you like nature and going on hikes and all that kind of stuff um 
it's tough to beat because they've got the volcanoes and the mountains and the jungle and it's just beautiful but yeah i'm going to take yeah, pictures i'm going to fly in a helicopter that's why i'm going to hawaii i've yeah. also never flown mm-hmm. in a helicopter you went to hawaii and flew in a helicopter that was rough for me that was a that was like a ooh yeah. ooh that that could that could be us but i'm i'm playing i'm oh. i'm in hagerstown maryland <laughs> house sitting a massive yeah. so, empty home crazy story my i have a friend named andy who used to be a wedding photographer he's from michigan he had a dream. I'm from Michigan. Yeah. He Damn. he had a do you did you have a picture of Hawaii on your door that you looked at every day as I want to live here or go there? Um, no, I had I had a he picture was a of a photographer. Map. Just and anywhere but here. Okay, so every, everywhere and anywhere. Yeah, fair. Yeah. He uh he kept his I don't know how he like found this opportunity actually, but I suppose he just kept um aware of whatever he could come across in terms of photography positions in Hawaii. And he found a business uh, started by, I think it was just one guy, no employees, I don't know, but he, he wanted to retire. And the business was flying in helicopters with tourists <laughs> to show them how to use their camera. And uh, I, I had forgotten exactly, cause this is the third time I've actually flown with him because he can get a pretty good discount. And <laughs> yeah. I know, I know, I, I didn't even want to say that, but Killing it's me. just amazing to me because it, it, the last time I did it, it was in 2019 and I had forgotten just how important it is to have a photographer because even if you don't like have that nice of a camera rig uh, and you just have your cell phone or something if you want actual decent pictures you don't want the pilot of the plane to guide you they don't they're just like anybody else they don't know anything about photography generally i mean they might have some sense but it was so cool to see andy work because he'll tell the pilot okay let's uh we, we can bank around here let's go to 2000 2000 feet uh, and then we're going to do two turns and, and like, let's go like, you know, three o'clock over to that rock. We'll turn. And then if we need to, again, we can take it from the left side. And then the next turn, can we go like a thousand feet? So he's like, literally like the pilot is, uh, like a drone or something. And, uh, it was super valuable because I, I don't know where these places are and like the, all the like interesting perspectives and where the cloud line tends to be relative to the shot. Like he just knows everything. So I so highly recommend clear, if you're a to photographer, be clear, no, hold up, yeah. hold up. To be clear, Andy's job is to sit in the helicopter <laughs> and tell the pilot where to fly and the photographer what like settings to use. Yes, and God he also takes it. photos himself. He, he takes a lot. I am yeah, wasting. Is hilarious. We are <laughs> wasting our lives. <sighs> no, he also does a lot of, I think, uh, commercial work in terms of like just flyovers in really complex areas to get like images for site surveys and stuff like that i don't think it's all like it's, it's not all fun and games go wherever you want yeah. yeah i also i started to feel a little sick and i was like and i have no shame or anything about getting sick i love throwing up because i know i'm gonna feel like a billion times so better much better after I, yes i hate that like clammy sweaty oh god i'm getting nauseous feelings just like just throw up <laughs> But uh, anyway, that has happened wow. several times on planes, but not um, not yet in helicopters. But I was starting to feel nauseous. And I was like, guys, uh, I need a bag just in case. And they were like, oh, yeah, here you go. And I was like, man, I bet I bet that they regularly have people not ask for the bag and just get right to the edge and lose it. And, you know, they got to clean that mess up. And the pilot was like, thank you so much for telling me. It's like, yeah, of course. Do people really just... I, I mean, I'm just thrilled that we're... Or barf bros that were both like, hell yeah, 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 give me the puke. I know. You might be the first person I've ever actually come across that immediately, you know what yeah, I'm talking it's about. it's the best. I will feel like Just... 9 trillion percent better after I puke. It's the greatest. Oh, yeah. I, I couldn't tell my mom about it. <laughs> I realized that I like needed to lie as a kid because I would like wake up and be like, oh, I feel nauseous. And then I'd puke and I'd feel great. And I'd be like, okay, I feel great. And my mom would be like, wonderful, you're going to school. I'm like, no. So yeah. I just would lie. I, I think a lot of his job, I'm sure like anything else, is doesn't just involve going wherever you want with a, another photographer friend. That's the other thing. Like, I, I know what I'm doing. He doesn't really have to guide me. He was just he was just planning the routes. Highly recommended, though, uh, if you can actually get a photographer guided tour like that. Uh, I'm not sure all helicopter. In fact, I'm guarantee you most helicopter tours. It's just like a stamp and repeat route that they take people and it's kind of 
what it is. The company, in case anybody listening is planning to go to Hawaii, is called Rainbow Helicopters, and they're based in Honolulu. And you can take, it's like 40 to 60 bucks to take a Southwest flight uh, intra-island to like all oh, the other God. islands. So I, I was, was actually... Like, I thought you were talking about the helicopter. I was like, it's 60 bucks. We're going. No. <laughs> like, <laughs> no. We're recording no. this next it's... episode from a helicopter. <laughs> They're based in Honolulu, so you can fly over there. I was actually in Maui, and it's just like... 20 minute flight over there and then you're already at the airport so you take off in your helicopter and then yeah uh we went all the way over to uh Molo- molokai which is a separate it's closer to maui but it's a separate section and uh yeah so we left honolulu flew around um, a couple different areas and then they dropped me off in maui so that was kind of nice i didn't have to like oh, fly that back and nice. forth that's the, this is this is some succession style shit. Well, yeah, I flew over for the day, and then they they were nice enough to drop me in the helicopter back at my not, island. It's not that expensive. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I got in my rental car, and like I had to get an Uber to get to my you know rental car where I'd parked it and all that. It was logistically like yeah, it's not like it'd be awesome if they heli padded me to the top of the hotel I was staying in, and I got to like just walk to my room or something but no (laughs) that would have been the magic but the magic helicopters are fun super dangerous though no we're it's not dangerous stop it we're not okay we'll talk about the dangers well they take the doors off too there were no doors i don't need doors doors are for chumps awesome for photos yeah it's great for photos it's true everything's strapped in yeah and i will say the uh general focal length that i shot with was a 50 which is kind of surprising uh, I, I remember having that realization in new zealand once where we were just walking around taking photos and i was very young you know which is i have very limited gear and i wanted to buy a new lens for the trip and it's like what focal length you know i'm taking landscape pictures probably something really wide but one of my favorite lenses to use for landscapes actually is an 85 which is kind of weird but like a 50 or an 85 really uh goes a long way and then you know maybe one wide lens for uh for landscapes but yeah i really like punching in on i think every photo i've shared so far except for the iphone picture was with that nikon 50 1.2 from the hawaii helicopter tour so uh, kind of interesting have you been to of course you have i know the answer are coming but have you been to iceland sam yeah of course mm-hmm. pick your would you like to go tropical Island or Frozen Island? We're going to go to an island. This frozen. is a frozen. Uh, okay, frozen. We're go to island. There's a direct flight like, from uh, BWI to Reykjavik. Wonderful. Yeah, there used to be an airline called Wow Air that went bankrupt and then like rebranded. I don't know. Iceland Air also used to, I don't know if that's the airline that flies there, but yeah, yeah Iceland Air is a, direct. A very cheap flight uh, through Wow Air. It's one of those super budget airlines that would charge you for like they weigh your bags and charge you if you were overweight and stuff like that. But if you followed all the rules and kept everything underweight, it would be like a hundred dollars direct flight. It's crazy cheap. It's like uh, it's no it's under wow. it's under six hundred bucks if you book okay. enough time from Reykjavik. Okay, we're gonna take some landscape photos in Iceland. Whew. I love signing cool. you up for plans that you did not agree to. This is beautiful. Well, beautiful. We should go this summer because the summer is when it's uh, daylight the longest by like July, I think there. I don't think oh, right, actually ever but we also entirely. I think we need to go in like May before other people get there. We can oh, research right. this. Okay. We have time. So I would also like to see the Paul, Northern Lights. We'll just go to Iceland. Oh, okay, cool. So, yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, I'm busy next week, uh, but the week after should be fine. <laughs> okay. You know, awesome. I'll uh, just give us a little little tour. Okay, well, great. Sam's going to go take more photos with his camera. I'm going to plan our Iceland trip. <laughs> We did it. What was this episode about? <laughs> God. Yeah. Uh, jet lag, I guess. Sam, I appreciate you. Thank you for joining me on a Saturday. I appreciate you. Saturday. This is my typical work day, so I'm happy to. What? Grateful I didn't have a wedding to shoot. <laughs> I am also grateful you did not have a wedding to shoot. You would have tried. I definitely would have. Yeah.